I am actually very grateful at this moment, this very instant, because God has saved the day as far as I'm concerned. I have this horrible lighting issue and there's like a cloud that moved in. Instead of getting all this glare, I'm able to record these videos while my son is taking a nap and we're getting ready to you know, do some family stuff together, but I'm finishing these up and I was like, oh, I hope it doesn't take that long. So I'm really glad about that. Zephaniah chapter two, we talked in chapter one about how God's judgment is real, how judgment is the other flip side of compassion in this idea of the day of the Lord, that without this idea that God is going to judge people, there is no need for compassion, that God's judgment is righteous and that it makes him holy and glorifies him. And so here in chapter two, we're going through uh, what Judah's enemies are being called uh, into. So uh, I'm just going to jump in here. Gather together. Yes, gather. O shameless nation before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. For Gaza shall be deserted, and Eshkelon shall become a desolation. Ashdod's people shall be driven out at noon, and Ekron shall be uprooted. So we see there's a warning, a very, just stop being a shameless nation. Before this happens, you have a way out. Turn yourself around. Do it immediately. And it kind of reminds me of Jonah a little bit. Um, Jonah's kind of a punk when he does it, but he goes into uh, Assyria, into Nineveh, and he goes, God's going to destroy you in 40 days. And they repent. We do not see that here. So in verse 5, Woe to you, inhabitants of the seacoast, you nation of the Cherethites! The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines, for I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left. And you, O seacoast, shall be pastures with meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah, on which they will graze. And in the houses of Ashkelon they will lie down at evening, for the Lord their God will be mindful of them and restore their fortunes. So he's saying, Philistines, watch out, you're going to be laid low. And Ashkelon, you're going to, you're going to be destroyed and it's going to be given back to Judah. I've heard the taunts of Moab and the revilings of the Ammonites, how they have taunted my people and made boasts against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab shall become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a land possessed by nettles and salt pits and a waste forever. The remnant of my people shall plunder them and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. This shall be their lot in return for their pride because they taunted and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome against them, for they will famish all the gods of the earth, and to him shall bow down, each in its place, all the lands of the nations. You also, O Cushites, uh, shall be slain by my sword, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. He will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like the desert. It's interesting, again, about the story of Jonah is Assyria actually repents, Nineveh repents, and then they're not destroyed in that story. Herd shall lie down in their midst, all kinds of beasts, even the owl and the hedgehog shall lodge in, their, in her capitals. A voice shall hoot in the window, devastation will be on the threshold, for her cedar work will be laid bare. This is the exultant city that lives securely. They said in her heart, I am and there is no one else. What a desolation she has become, a lair for wild beasts. Everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. So all of these, these are nations that are East, south, west, north, northeast, south, and west. I said north last because Assyria is to the north, but um, and that's the one of the last ones. But it's interesting because it's like he's going all the way around the city and saying every single person outside the walls is going to get it. God is going to clobber them for what they've done. Now, before I jump into the next section, this these are all the outside enemies. These are all the people outside the walls. The next section is actually for Judah itself, and it is a longer. This section on Assyria, I think, is three verses. I'm going to check real quick. You're getting an inside look. Here's four verses for Moab. Here's three. Right. So the longest one is these these four verses for Moab and Ammonites. 
Judah gets, sorry if I'm making you a little dizzy moving this around, Judah gets eight verses by themselves. So right here at the beginning of chapter three, it actually goes into it and Judah gets the harshest judgment. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to the Lord. So Judah's being called out because she's not listening. She's not accepting correction. She's not listening to her prophets. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. They're trusting in the fortifications of their city. They're trusting in their own wealth, their own self-sufficiency. They're not trusting in God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. So he's saying, look, your, your institutions are corrupt. Up here, we see the oppressing city. God is not all about oppression. However, it's interesting to me because in America, this is something that the, the left and the progressives are really latched onto is this idea of oppression. And as they talk about oppression, they're actually talking about oppressing certain views. It's not that they're against oppression of everybody. It's that they want the previously oppressed people to oppress the other people now. It's like this upside down clown world situation. So... Again, we see, okay, your officials, your prophets, your judges, all of these are people that are in authority that are doing the wrong thing. He's calling them all out here. And so we have six, seven, and eight here. This is continuing the, you know, railing against Judah here. I've cut off nations. Their battlements are in ruins. I've laid waste their streets so that no one walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. So it's like when they were called out for their sin, they, they were prideful and they doubled down in it. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed." And I love this imagery here because it's talking about how God is going to pour out his wrath as in a fire. And a fire is like this cleansing thing. It's, it's shown time and time again. The point of fire in the New Testament parables about the kingdom of God is that it's purifying, that the fire comes in and disciplines those. It, it makes people draw either closer to God in humility and all of his glorious power or it's a rejection of it, and people get destroyed by it. In their haughtiness, their pride, they're, they're destroyed. They can't stand up to it. And so in this section, we just see, just to recap, we see judgment against God's enemies all around the compass points, northeast, south, uh, and west. It's a call to repentance and salvation, even for all nations. I don't want to lose sight of that in this section. All the nations are called to repent and worship God. All of them, Philistines, Moab, Ammonites, Cushites, Assyria, all of these people <clears throat> are told to turn it around and worship God so that they can be saved. The salvation is not just for Judah. And in fact, it's not, not only is it not just for Judah, but Judah gets the harshest punishment of all because they should have been God's chosen in doing this all along. And so the church really needs this today, all right? Uh, this is getting the log out of your own eye before getting the speck out of other people's. And it's a little bit flipped here because we have the external, he's going after the external nations first. But he's calling on Judah to clarify themselves, to get themselves in the proper position so that they can be a witness to the world. And they're not doing that. They're doubling down on their sinfulness. They're being a horrible example. And so this is what Jordan, Peter says, uh, Jordan Peterson says is making your own bed. You need to be going through and making your bed every morning. You need to be taking care of your own household. You need to be taking care of your family. You need to be taking care of your church. You need to be taking care of your nation. All of these things are here. And we see it in this pattern. He's calling out Judah for how individuals are acting, whether it's, you know, being sold out to wealth or power. He's talking about uh, the officials of the nation being corrupt. This, all of these things, it's pointing to this idea that you need to get your 
community right with God. And that's the whole pattern of transformation, isn't it? Is that we become transformed by Jesus Christ. We transform and provide for our families. We provide for our churches and our churches provide for our nations. And it, that's the transformation happens one man at a time. So just a very interesting section here, but I hope that that ties in. And again, this all ties into this idea of the day of the Lord. Next up, we're going to talk about the conversion of the nations and, and all these different aspects. But as we look at this chapter and, and the, the beginning of chapter three, this is a warning and a warning is compassionate. God is not saying this is definite and it's, he's actually telling them, guys, there are consequences for your actions. Please turn it around. In Lamentations, we see that the people finally recognize the consequences of their actions and it is horrible. And there's regret and there's suffering, there's pain. God is sending this warning to turn it around. Now, some people would ask, well, why didn't God just avoid it in the first place? Because God He's not going to tolerate. He's a holy being. And so he provides a bridge where we couldn't provide one, but we still have the personal responsibility to put our faith in it, to believe God, take him at his promises, to believe in it, to act that out in the world, to live as if we believe it, all of those things. So I think this is just a fantastic... It's funny that some of the chapters that are most harsh about the punishment are the ones that are in fact the most compassionate. But I, that's kind of one of my takeaways after reading Zephaniah. So I think that uh, that's what we've got for today. I hope you liked something. Put down in the comments if there was something that stood out. Um, I really like this format. Let me know if you like the format. Let me know if you like me reading the whole thing or what. Um, but anyways, like and subscribe to catch all these videos as they come out, and I will catch you in the next video shortly. All right? Peace.